Well, we're beginning a new chapter, chapter 9, and not just a new chapter, but a new section in the textbook. For the next three chapters, we'll sort of be on the same theme. A budget is, at the very heart, a detailed financial plan of how we're going to get things done. It's basically our strategy quantified. And there are two roles to budgeting. The first one, obviously, is planning. The second one is control. And by planning, we're talking about the actual budgeting process itself. What level of sales are we going to have? What's our level of production? What, what, what raw materials or direct labor do we need to support that? Then we have our control process, which is we look at our budget and we ask, are we over or under budget? Each one of those things, being over budget is bad. Being under budget can sometimes be bad as well, and we'll see that later on. And budgeting is undertaken because there are a certain number of advantages behind it. Number one, it provides transparent objectives so that everybody sort of sees, well, here are the level of sales, this is the level of production, these are the costs we have to come in at, so that it promotes employee understanding of the, of the overall picture. It promotes longer-term thinking. Without a plan, what do you have? You have responses to day-to-day -day events and day-to-day -day activities without any clear idea of how it fits into the whole. So we don't know what's important to pay attention to and what's not. So the budget provides a longer-term perspective on what we're doing day-to-day. -day. It also allows for the efficient allocation of resources. If we are planning for a certain level of activity and we don't have the resources in place to meet that activity, it allows us to transfer resources to the activity. That being said, it also uncovers bottlenecks. If our production facility can't meet the level of output needed for the budgeted amount of sales, there's a problem. Provides benchmarks for evaluating actual performance. So that by planning something, by planning out a course of action, and then implementing that plan, we can then look back and see, well, you know, how far off were we? Did we come in under budget, over budget? So that it allows us to correct a problem early in the process. I mean, if we don't know where we're headed, we don't know whether each day is successful or not. By having a budget in place, we can, check, we can track day to day, almost minute to minute, our sales meeting the targets that we set. That brings in something called responsibility accounting. And the main goal or the main message behind this is that managers should only be held responsible for the things that they can influence, for the decisions that they have control over. You can't make the production manager responsible for hitting sales targets. That's not under their influence. So they should only be held responsible for the things that they can influence. And every line item in a budget should have somebody responsible for it. So the budgets also identify who needs to make decisions about what. So nothing falls through the cracks. So the production manager doesn't say, that's not my responsibility. And the sales manager says, well, it's not my responsibility. Every line item in a budget has somebody who's responsible for it somewhere. How long do we budget for the budget period? Typically, it is one year. So let's draw out a timeline for one year. And the one year is usually a fiscal year. Listen, forecasting for longer than one year, even for well-established companies, brings in way too much uncertainty and, and way too much variability. So it's really not worth doing more than a year. The year is typically broken down by quarters, with the first quarter typically broken out by months. So your first quarter, your coming, the quarter coming up, you'll typically have monthly budgets for, followed by three quarterly budgets for the year. As the first month falls off, we typically add the next month. And then as that next month falls off, we add the next month. So we always have at least three months of budgets in front of us, followed by the quarters. And as each one quarter falls off, we add Q2, Q3, we add the next quarter of the next year. And this month, this quarter, will also be broken down into months. So at any given time, we have our next three months of budgets followed by three quarters. This is called a rolling year. So as each month falls off, we add one more month to the end. As each quarter falls off, we add a quarter to the end. It's called a continuous or a perpetual budget. 
So it's not as if budgets are made for the year and then you don't have to revisit it again till next year. You're always in the process of budgeting. That's why it's called continuous or perpetual budgeting. So let's look at an organizational chart. We'll put top management up here. We'll just do three layers of management. Middle management uh, will follow. And then we'll follow that up with a supervisory level. Now budgeting can be done two ways. It can be done from the top level of management downwards and that's referred to as top-down budgeting. Typically what happens is that top management sets targets for the year because they feel that it's too critical to leave to anyone else. These are the targets we need. These, this is what we have to hit no matter what the organization has to perform. In other words, the budgets are imposed upon lower levels of management. Another way to do it is from the bottom up. We start at the lower levels and we continually move the budgets higher and higher through the organization. This is called participative budgeting. Everybody gets a say in what the budget should be. It tends to be more accurate because people in the bottom line, at the bottom line or the front lines, have a better idea of what's possible. It creates more commitment, creates more motivation. If a budget's imposed upon me that I think can't be met, I actually get demotivated. But if I'm part of the process of setting the budget, and I set it, you know, not an easy one, but a challenging one, but attainable, I'm more motivated to meet that. Now, obviously, I can play with the numbers and make myself look good by betting low, so they are reviewed. My numbers go up to the next level of management who then reviews it and says, ah, this is a little too low. The review process reduces something called budgetary slack. And budgetary slack is the, the uh, uh, ability of a lower level manager to underestimate the revenue that they can generate or underestimate uh, or, or sorry, overestimate the expenses so that I can always come in saying, hey, look, my sales were a lot higher than I thought. Give me my bonus. Or look, hey, my expenses are a lot lower than I thought. Give me my bonus. So that review process from the top down uh, sort of helps to eliminate that. And for an example of what that looks like, uh, let's go for a ride with Star Trek. Yeah, well, I told the captain I'd have this analysis done in an hour. How long would it really take? An hour? Oh, you didn't tell him how long it would really take, did you? Well, of course I did. Oh, laddie, you've got a lot to learn if you want people to think of you as a miracle worker. Well, a little bit of vocabulary to get out of the way right at the very end before we move on. A stretch budget. And I think we can all sort of guess what that means right away. It's a budget that is highly difficult to achieve. In other words, you're not just setting the bar high. You're setting it really high. And some people may wonder, well, why do that? Why set it so high that you probably can't reach it? Well, that's why it's called a stretch budget, right? It Because it requires new ways of doing or new ways of thinking so that this that doing it the way we used to do it isn't gonna make it this time we have to try something new so you may have sales targets that, that are just way out of line with what we've done in the past well we gotta find a way to do it so it, it, it fosters or perhaps may promote some sort of process innovation out-of-the-box thinking on the other hand it can discourage uh, managers may look at these budgets, uh, these stretch budgets, and say, oh, come on, like, come on, how, 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 how are we going to get this done? And it actually demotivates that by setting a high target that's achievable but not out of reach, it might be better than setting something that's called a stretch budget. Zero-based budgeting. This does not use previous periods as a baseline. So in other words, to budget for next quarter, we don't take this quarter and say, well, let's increase sales X percent, and then everything just gets increased by a certain percentage. It does not use a previous period as a baseline. The baseline is zero in each period, so that all numbers generated must be justified each period. 